Good evening. It's nice to see everyone here this evening. I'm Lynette Clementson, and I'm director of Wallace House here at the University of Michigan. We run two programs. Those of you here in Ann Arbor uh, are likely familiar with the Knight Wallace Fellowships for Journalists. That's a residential program here at the university. We bring a group of accomplished journalists here every year for uh, an academic year of immersive study here at the university to uh, sharpen their journalism skills and move them forward in their careers. It's the other program that we run that brings us here tonight, the Livingston Awards for Young Journalists. In the journalism, uh, in the journalism world, the Livingston Awards are one of the most prestigious prizes you can receive. Uh, some people refer to it in shorthand as the Pulitzers for the Young. Most people do not know that the Livingston Awards are housed here at the University of Michigan. We give three prizes every year for excellence in reporting, one for excellence in local reporting, one for national reporting, and one for international reporting. It is one of our winners for national reporting that brings us here tonight. Ronan Farrow won the Livingston Award for National Reporting last year for his reporting for The New Yorker on Harvey Weinstein. I would like to invite everyone to be part of the conversation uh, as we move through the evening. Our guests are going to be in a discussion here, and then uh, we're going to open up at the end for questions. We will have mics in the audience, and people will be able to direct you to the microphones to share your questions. And also we have people following us on live stream this evening. We would like to invite you to follow the conversation and submit your questions using the hashtag Wallace House. There will be someone here tracking Twitter and we'll make sure that your questions are part of the question and answer conversation. It's good to see so many people in this room tonight. Um, we do these public events through Wallace House Presents because we believe in the power of journalism to spark conversation and to get people civically involved in the issues that are informing the way we live our lives. And I think certainly uh, the reporting that came from the time period around October 2017 is an example of the strength of what journalism can do when it hits at a moment when people are ready to talk about something. In October of 2017, Ronan Farrow wrote a story detailing the first on-the-record abuses by Harvey Weinstein. We'll learn more tonight that this was an open secret in Hollywood and in much of the journalism world, but Ronan did something extraordinary. He managed to get women to go on the record. The person who's interviewing him tonight, Ken Aletta, also a reporter with The New Yorker, had tried to get the same story many years before in 2002. And you'll hear how they worked together to make sure that Ronan's story would see the light of day and be published. When that work was published, along with the reporting of two reporters from The New York Times, Jody Cantor and Megan Tuohy, who also wrote about Harvey Weinstein, Harvey Weinstein at this time, it set off a national and then international movement, picking up on Me Too, which had already started uh, in social media, and then moving through a series of stories where we saw many heads of industry across all industries in media, in Hollywood, in academia, um, finally have to account for bad behavior. And the reporting of Ronan, Megan, and Jody also emboldened many reporters across the country to pursue similar stories, stories that they had been hearing for years and needed the backing to nail down, needed some sort of validation from other people who had had this experience that they would be safe in telling these stories. This resulted in a series of stories that went across certainly national and international media, 
but also in regional media, also in local media, and even here at the University of Michigan. And to show the reach of this reporting, I'd like to bring out two University of Michigan students, Sammy Sussman, a sophomore, and Nisa Khan, a senior. Um, in October of 2018, Nisa Khan wrote a story about what it is like here at the University of Michigan to report sexual harassment and abuse. And in December of 2018, Sammy Sussman wrote a story about a professor here in the School of Music, Theater, and Dance uh, who had been moving through his career with some 40 years across multiple institutions of uh, complaints about sexual harassment and abuse. And these two reporters at the Michigan Daily would not have written their stories, would not have felt that they could pursue their stories without this reporting from the New Yorker. And so to introduce Ken and Ronan, I would like to invite to the stage our own student reporters who also need your support, Nisa Khan and Sammy Sussman. Speak a bit first about how. Um, Stand right in front sorry. of me. I'll speak a bit first about how uh, Ronan's reporting influenced my reporting. Um, so, in October 2017, when Ronan broke his article along with uh, Jody Cantor and Megan Tui. Um, sorry. Stand right in front of the mic. All right. There we go. Can you hear me? Good. All right. Um, so. Ronan Farrow's reporting in October 2017, along with that of Jody Cantor and Megan Tui, really changed the national conversation around sexual misconduct. It showed survivors that speaking out could make a difference, that no one had the power to suppress these allegations. And it showed other newspapers and reporters, such as the Michigan Daily, that neither fear of litigation nor fear of professional retribution need prevent reporting on these stories. On a personal level, my article about 40 years of sexual misconduct claims against an um, SMT professor would never have happened without Ronan's reporting. Um, one of the survivors of Stephen Ships' abuse from 1979 contacted the University of Michigan right after his article came out saying something similar had happened to her involving a professor here at the university. And um, after she then contacted other survivors of Ships and they c contacted me and after about four or five months of work I was able to document um, this abuse over 40 years. So it really never would have happened if he hadn't started this conversation. Yeah, and um, with Broken Record, we follow a student we refer to as Taylor and her claims and the personal impact it had on her career and her family. Um, her willingness to talk to me and Maya Goldman, who is our current AIC, um, really helped open a door to kind of the intricate details about the university Title IX process that um, some people may just not know about. And Taylor's own belief in speaking out was fueled by the Me Too movement and the changes in how the public is responding to survivors. So are we good to introduce you? So, um, First off, just because I'm supposed to introduce Rona now, it's, Ronan's quite an intimidating person to introduce. Um, <laughs> do we start with his graduation from college at 15, his work at the State Department for Richard Holbrook, his book interviewing every living Secretary of State, his reporting on Harvey Weinstein, his Pulitzer Prize, or the doctorate he also got somewhere in there? Um, it's a little, there's his Wikipedia bio. On a more serious note, though, <laughs> Uh, his groundbreaking reporting on Harvey Weinstein, Eric Schneiderman, and Les Moonves has really become the gold standard of sexual misconduct reporting. Um, his initial article set off a tidal wave of societal change, and his further reporting on ex-Mossad agents and non-disparagement um, agreements has unveiled the tools at the disposal of America's most powerful figures as they seek to silence their many victims. Few reporters can claim to have had as widespread an influence on the greater cultural lexicon as can Mr. Farrow. has become a catalyst unto himself in the Me Too era. And I have the pleasure of introducing Ken Oletta. He has a long storied career in journalism, starting in the New Yorker in 1977. Annals of Communication has been a series he spearheaded since 1992, a deep dive into how we view media, its revolution, and its evolution. Ken Oletta's work has been profiling leaders from large companies for years now, from Larry Page to Sheryl Sandberg to Ted Turner, the last of which has won a National Magazine Award for that year's best profile. Ms. Aletta's work delves into the suppressive practices in specific industry, industries where culture can sometimes turn toxic. 
In 2002, he published a profile of Weinstein's own history of abuse of women, famously known as Beauty and the Beast, a piece as we as inspiring journalists have looked up to as a shining example of how to cover another world. Their work has exposed deep institutional flaws within the media industry, intimidation and threats that are passed off as byproducts of an old-fashioned boys club mentality. As young people entering this field, we inspire to the values of honesty, sensitivity, and courage embodied by these reporters. We also hope that future generations can overcome these deeply embedded practices that are all too prevalent in the American workforce. And just one more thing. Above all, um, we just want to remember that as much as we're going to talk tonight about journalism, that survivors are really the centerpiece of this movement. Um, they're more important to me, too, than any specific journalist, and it's their bravery that pushes us all forward. So thank you. Thank you. So, so they, Sammy and Nisa quickly escaped. Um, but I want to say, even though they mentioned that it was a bit intimidating to meet Ronan and Ken, uh, it is worth noting that Sammy, before he broke this major story, uh, wrote uh, classical music uh, critiques for the Michigan Daily and had never done a news story before this tip fell into his lap. Um, and the story that Nisa and Maya pursued was equally ambitious. And I want to say a thank you to them for having the courage, actually, to step forward and say, I think I have something here. I don't know how to do it, but I think there's something here. And for all of the editors, all of the advisors, all of the lawyers who came together to help them figure out how to get their stories from a tip to the page. This is how journalism is done, whether it is for the Michigan Daily or for the New Yorker. You get a tip and you rigorously follow it through and there are a legion of people behind the scenes who are helping you check facts, make sure that you are legally within the bounds for the things that you are writing editing so that your story is tight and compelling and understandable. And so for anyone in the room who has been involved in any of these stories that the Michigan Daily has done, um, I would applaud you. And while we also have in the room some of our colleagues from Michigan Radio, who this year had a podcast called Believed that detailed the stories of victims of Larry Nassar, we are doing excellent work here in Ann Arbor and the journalism that is now, I think, spread across the country, inspired by the work of Ken and Ronan. Um, if we could just take a moment to thank our own local journalists, because they need as much support as our national reporters do. You're still talking? I, come on out. <laughs> And now I'd like to welcome to the stage Ken Aletta and Ronan Farrow. Hi, Ken. Ronan, how are you, sir? I'm honored to be here with you. So what people want to know, how did you come to the Harvey Weinstein story? I was assigned it uh, at a network that I was a reporter at. And what I was assigned specifically was a very narrow thread of it. It was a series of tweets by the actress Rose McGowan. Um, I had been working on uh, a mini-series for an investigative uh, show that I had on, that aired on the, t the Today Show, their big morning show, uh, on sexual harassment in Hollywood. And within the development conversations around that, one of the executives there said, well, what about Rose McGowan's tweets? Those tweets turned out to be about Harvey Weinstein, and this led to a rabbit hole that none of the people in that conversation could have anticipated. So what happened next? <laughs> well, uh, Rose McGowan went on the record, and she had a rape allegation, which is now very publicly known. But she uh, then pulled back from you at some point, right? Much, much later. Uh, so she went on the record in January, February, uh, and then 
after a very long, fraught process uh, where she felt jerked around. Uh, she then tried to pull back her interview in August, late August. Uh, what had happened in the interim was this extraordinary snowball effect of that first interview uh, and several others that were actually done in the days before it, where I had already started accumulating accounts from executives within Weinstein's company and um, multiple people had gone on camera saying we witnessed a pattern of harassment and abuse and cover-ups. Um, and then after that interview, more women came forward. More women went on the record. Uh, more women provided evidence of both settlements and also admissions of guilt by Harvey Weinstein. Did they go on the record at that point because they felt comfort in numbers, or, well, or was it Well, this is always the charm? complicated question we all, we all face as reporters, right? I mean, how, how does it happen that this miraculous thing transpires where people relive the most difficult experience of a lifetime and put themselves in the line of fire to expose wrongdoing? Uh, you know, and, and you might be better positioned to ask the sources, but from my standpoint, it was a realization that if they didn't speak up, it was going to happen again. By April of 2017, I had an audio tape made in a New York Police Department sting operation in which Harvey Weinstein uh, tried to cajole a woman into going into a hotel room with him, um, corroborated her claim that he had assaulted her the day before, um, said, yes, I'm sorry, I'm used to that. Uh, Grabbing her breasts. Right. She, she was wearing a wire, doing an incredibly brave thing, cooperating with the police to get him to admit to this assault that she had alleged. And he did, in very explicit terms, repeatedly. And I was able to get that audio. Uh, and by that point, can it you know, we had conversations not long after that, it became very clear to me that that story had to break. And that if it didn't, I would have a degree of guilt for allowing it to sit there while perhaps predation was continuing, because some of these accounts were quite recent. So here we are. Uh, you and I did a long interview in July of 2017. And you told me then that I had tried to get Harvey, to nail Harvey Weinstein years before and again in 2015, but I couldn't get, I, unlike my friend here, couldn't get women to acknowledge uh, and go public. And you told me at that time that you had three, three women on camera, one was Rose mm -hmm. McGowan, mm -hmm. uh, who by name, face, you saw mm -hmm. them. You had five women on camera but shielded their names and their face was shielded. And you had the Amber audio tape, the woman, the Italian model. I said, my God, you got it. You've broken the story that people like me couldn't break. And then in August of 2017, NBC killed it. Mm -hmm. What happened? Well, <laughs> I've worked very hard sincerely to keep the focus on the women and their allegations. Uh, and I felt like it was important for a long time to make sure the story was those allegations and not the story behind the story. But I do think that, you know, the public correctly has questions about the role the media plays in covering this up sometimes. And there will absolutely be a time and place where I think that story can be told properly. Um, certainly, Namely I, your book. <laughs> I mean, meaning, right, I think, I think right. it is a... Uh, it is an investigative project as challenging as the, the story itself. Um, and, you know, it's important to be fair to everyone involved. So Ronan and do it carefully. is saying he's not going to share that by the book. <laughs> but, what, but what Ken is saying is, is fundamentally true. You know, I've, I've, it varied depending on the exact date. But what I told you, that we had multiple women on camera, was true. There was never a version of the story that didn't have a named woman in it. Um, and we had these explosive pieces of evidence. You know, we had seen a his signature on a million dollar settlement contract and that woman offered to bring in that contract to the NBC lawyers. Uh, you know, we had this explosive audio which once it broke was of course on every channel all day for several days straight. Um, there was no doubt in the mind of any journalist who looked at that that this was a huge story and 
it became clear to me that it was worth uh, you know, anything that happened to my career to try to get that out. You know, back in 2002, uh, for The New Yorker, I did a profile of Harvey. And, and I had information that he had raped a woman and paid her $250,000. Paid another woman who defended the woman. This was during Shakespeare in Love, making the, that movie. Another 250. Got them both to sign non-disclosure agreement. People who whispered the story to me, uh, I then pursued the two women. They would not talk. Um, none of the other women who whispered would talk. And so I failed to get names when I confronted Harvey Weinstein at the time. Harvey said these were consensual affairs. And so we had to decide at the New Yorker, are we the National Enquirer? Are we going to publish anonymous versus him publicly saying it didn't happen? And we didn't publish it. For many years, uh, stories or rumors about Harvey would surface, Hollywood Reporter and stuff, but nothing ever came to be. How, what is it that you think, why did you succeed in getting, and why did Jody, Jody and, and, and Meg Tui in, in the New York Times succeed in getting women to feel comfortable enough to come forward? So the, the story that ran several weeks after you mentioned, uh, you know, it, it did not run as a television piece, uh, had, uh, I believe, 13 women's stories uh, and more than half of those on the record. And I think the reason for that is although I couldn't tell those sources as they were doing this incredibly brave thing that they would be heard, that there would be a version of the universe that we would all live in a year later where people would care about their stories and the stories would matter and there would be accountability because of them. But I could say, for the first time in recent history, hey, there are some slivers of precedent here that are promising. There are the women who, for years, struggled to make themselves heard about Bill Cosby, um, who were at that point, in late 2016, early 2017, still very much smeared and maligned, but the stories were out there and they were, they were fomenting and, and in my view, gaining momentum. You know, when I was anchoring an hour of cable a day, I would fill that time with stories that, from Cosby accusers because I thought it was an underrepresented issue. There was this series of stories broken by the New York Times about Fox News, uh, which were very significant. Gretchen Carlson coming forward, you know, as a powerful woman with a platform and saying, I was harassed in this setting. Those were all precedents I could point to. And it didn't sell everyone, and sometimes it took months of intensive conversation because this was a decision that upended people's lives. But it was, I think, different from the environment you were working in uh, almost 20 years earlier. But you know, it's interesting. I, I would have conversations with David while you were reporting your first set of stories uh, for The New Yorker, and I would talk to David Remnick, the editor, and he would say to me, God, it's amazing to watch Ronan Farrow on the phone with these women. He is just talking to them with, with, and, and with great empathy and just making them feel comfortable. And I just love, he's saying, I love listening to these conversations. And I can't believe it. Pam McCarthy, the deputy editor, said the same thing to me. One of the things that, that strikes me uh, is that you don't give yourself enough credit and the Times reporters don't. Because the truth of the matter is that, that Yes, the culture changed. Yes, Cosby and Ailes and O'Reilly happened. But what's missing from that analysis is the painstaking work that you did to make these women feel comfortable enough to be brave and, and not to be fearful that this monster was going to kill them. Thank you, Ken. It means a lot, and it, honestly, hearing that moves me almost to tears because it was a very difficult time in my life, too, as a reporter. Um, you know, I was losing my job over this. Uh, I didn't know if I would ever work again in journalism. I had a very powerful guy saying he was going to throw a huge legal team at me, that he knew I didn't have a news organization behind me anymore, um, and that he was coming for me with everything he had. And 
the encouragement of a reporter I really respected when I first encountered Ken and talked to him and he said, keep going, you know, what you have, first of all, you said you have it, you know, the moment I told you about the re recording. Oh, I was so thrilled, I couldn't believe it. He was excited. <laughs> Which is a funny thing about such a dark topic, but he had cared so profoundly for years. And, and then, you know, when, it, when I really knew that the story was in trouble, the first call I made was to Ken, and the fact that he was generous enough to call David Remnick, the editor at The New Yorker, and that David did have that outlook, that he knew it was important and still cared all those years later. The counterpoint meant so much to me because I had spent a long period of time in conversations with these women who I knew were doing something significant for society at great personal risk. And all I wanted desperately was to tell them, not only do I have your back and I'm gonna protect you and do this right, but also there's a news organization that's gonna be a tank and go into this thing and because I have the evidence, this is gonna go forward. And I didn't have that. I sat in, in rooms with executives over and over again who said, you know, these women are crazy, they're not credible, it's not a story, it'll never be a story, people are not gonna care about this. Who's heard of Harvey Weinstein? Is our average viewer in the Midwest gonna care? You know, on and on and on. And this is, all, this is NBC, in case. Well, but, but it's a not, A preview you know. of the book. <laughs> but, but ultimately, that's not a story about NBC per se, it's a story about right. what allows secrets like right. this to fester decade after decade. And there were a number of news organizations that folded on important stories of this type because powerful, wealthy men held the reins and were able to manipulate and control the media. And so one thing that I think you helped change, Ken, in being so, so generous and helping to make sure the story saw the light of the day, is I think, I think media outlets are gonna have a lot of trouble passing once they have real evidence of ongoing criminal activity going forward. I think that the incentive structure is gonna change when that full story is told. You know, one of the things I was wary of when I first talked to Ronan in the spring of 2017, um, and you were doing this investigation of Harvey Weinstein, but I knew of your history with Woody Allen. And so in my mind, I'm saying, is Ronan Farrow a zealot or is he a journalist? And you convinced me that you were a journalist when you, when you came to it. And when I called Remnick about you in August of 2017, the word I used, I said, and I think he probably had that same question in his mind that we didn't express it, I said, Ronan Farrow is judicious, and which is what you want a good journalist to be. Careful, not presuming, just aggressively searching for the truth. Have you encountered that from people at suspicion? Is he a zealot? Well, it was the main argument Harvey Weinstein ultimately used and you know, showed up in his legal threat letters and so forth, this, you know, this case that my sister had been raped and therefore I cared about the issue too much. I was on a crusade. Um, look, a, a conflict of interest would have been if I had a business deal that went bad with Harvey Weinstein. The truth is, I only had very positive associations with Harvey Weinstein. Uh, I was vaguely aware of his kind of larger than life stature in the industry and things that had shown up in profiles like yours, that he had a volcanic temper and was sort of a colorful, uh, scrappy character. I think the word we used in the first of those stories was rough hewn. Um, you know, and very talented in terms of uh, having an eye for talent and uh, uh, producing the films that he did. Uh, I had only ever had very polite cocktail party conversation with him. I think once or twice I had, I had met him, shaking his hand. The, the honest to God truth is the only incentive I had as someone who moved in those media worlds was to not piss off Harvey Weinstein. Uh, the separate phenomenon you of... You failed at that. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I definitely failed at that. <laughs> the, the very separate phenomenon of someone in your family is affected by sexual violence is not a conflict of interest. It is so attenuated from the specifics of the fact pattern. Does it make me care about the issue and understand its importance? Absolutely. I had, you know, 
distinctive personal insight on the fact that this mattered and that these stories weren't heard enough. And for sure that contributed to my passion in sticking with the story. And that would be true, I imagine, of any one of you who cares about someone who has been a survivor of that kind of violence. But there was never any question, and this was, you know, it was one of the first conversations we had at The New Yorker. I, you know, showed them everything I had. I said that Harvey Weinstein had made this argument, and they just laughed it out of the room. Um, you know, reporters can have family situations where they care about the issue, and it has nothing to do with their feelings about the subject of the story, any personal animosity. As far as Harvey Weinstein went, I went, went in blank slate. Um, both of my parents had been in films distributed by him, I'd worked with him in that attenuated way, but we knew that from the very outset of the reporting. Back in January of, uh, of 2017, we had you know, all sat around in my newsroom and Googled and made sure that there was no connection greater than that. Let, let's broaden it beyond Harvey. Um, when you think about someone like Les Moonves, the ousted president and CEO of, of CBS. They also failed at not pissing him off. <laughs> you, you've, got, you've got quite a few people that don't like you, huh? <laughs> I have a lot of people that don't like me. It's a compliment. <laughs> the, how do you think that people like Les Moonves or Mr. Nasser here or, or, or Harvey Weinstein or Bill Cosby, how do you think they think they can get away with this shit? The answer is power. It's power structures and power imbalances, and that can be, you know, you're Les Moonves and you're the most powerful man in all of media, or it can be that you're a doctor and a trusted figure and you've convinced parents that you're a trusted authority figure. Uh, and I, I hope one of the lessons of all of these brave sources coming forward is that that's got to stop and we've all got to be vigilant about the abuse of power and that our institutions and structures in our society need to hold the powerful more accountable. Because you only get figures like the ones that you just mentioned through years and years of nobody standing up to them. So at night when a Les Moonves goes home and puts his head on the pillow, or Harvey Weinstein, or name your choice. What do they say to themselves about what they've just done? Les Moonves is just taking this 24-year-old aspiring actress and put, pushed her head down on his penis, or Harvey has raped someone. How do they explain to themselves what they just did, or don't they? Well, this is why you writing this biography of Harvey Weinstein is incredibly valuable and, and quite separate from the scope of anything that I've done. You know, my, my job was so narrow in those investigations. It was very much about the facts, the facts, the facts, and establishing the facts and triangulating the facts and getting the documents and getting the audio uh, and multiple sourcing everything. Psychologizing and understanding uh, how someone becomes a serial sexual offender is a very complicated and separate project, and I don't know that I have the answer to that. I, I do think that the insight that I've gleaned from reporting not just on individuals but on institutions is that the structures allow the abuse and the repeated allowances that are made exacerbate the problem and there is a sense of impunity at a certain point. Where, where I, I honestly think the sense I get based on the renderings of the behavior that I heard, for instance, in that, the Moonbez story, talking to you know, the, the twelfth woman to give me a story, was I don't, I don't think there was a lot of thought about it afterwards, you know, by the time it had been going on for so many years. And that's a particularly good example that reinforces the point I'm making about institutions, because the reason I felt that story was so important. And I, I started working on it the day, I conducted the first interview the day after the first Weinstein story broke, and then worked on it for eight months. And the reason I thought it was so important was that where Harvey Weinstein had run a small, kind of almost family-owned shop with his brother, his power was significant but very much waning by the time the allegations came forward, 
in Les Moonves, you had an individual who was riding high. Who Arguably the most successful modern television executive. That's right. And was, at the time of the reporting, considered to be invincible by Wall Street. You know, that he was synonymous with that company's success. And because of that, there was a board that he had engineered at that company. He had set up his contracts in a way that it would be too in the weeds to get into here, but essentially it allowed him to control the composition of that board. And you know, he was making 60 million plus a year. And the board was so in the tank and so dominated by people who prized profit over accountability that they literally covered up criminal investigation that was happening at one point, multiple allegations that they knew about. The Times broke a story after my series of CBS stories where they, they actually had some accounts of inside those boardroom discussions where they had one gentleman on that board saying, you know, I don't care if it's 16, 17, 18 women, you know, he's got to stay. And that is what creates the psychology. That's what creates the impunity. How, what, talk, staying on the psychology point, one of the things that's fascinating about many of these cases, both the Cosby case and, for instance, the Harvey Weinstein case, is that many of these women who were victims nevertheless continued to email the pe person who brutalized them and say, I miss you, look forward to seeing you again. What, you have a psychological explanation for that? I think any survivor of sexual violence would be very familiar with that. that look, uh, rapes happen in marriages. That's well understood psychologically, culturally, legally. Uh, rapes happen with you know, your family member, your pastor, your doctor, your boss. It's people that you have to deal with again. And to me, it was always slightly mystifying that, for instance, Harvey Weinstein spent so much energy and paid so much money to private investigators just trying to establish that women were friendly with him after the allegations. Now, That's a major defense his lawyers are going to use in the New York trial. It is. It is. Now, I, I, I don't think you know, we should take survivors at their word. That's never been uh, my attitude in this. Do you disagree with Me Too who says you should? I don't know that, look, I can't speak for a disembodied Me Too movement. I have tremendous respect for, for instance, Tarana Burke, who I think is heroic and a brilliant activist. Um, I haven't heard her personally say, believe all survivors. Maybe that's her attitude and, and maybe that's a helpful attitude to have as an activist and someone whose role is much more about uh, playing a therapeutic role than, than a reporter's would be. But for me as a reporter, the mandate is listen to all survivors. Hear them out because we were not listening as a society. And the, the most powerful thing that I can do as a reporter is to actually be as skeptical as possible and really stress test any claim that comes forward. And so, you know, when you look at these claims of like, oh, there's emails after the fact, I would actually say that my view of it would be much more granular. It, is there an email that specifically controverts the, the facts that are claimed on a specific day, you know? Is there something that actually uh, interferes with the fact pattern that's being claimed? If so, maybe that's useful in a case. Maybe that's admissible. Maybe that's something that I would consider seriously as a reporter. But the picture of the actress smiling with Harvey Weinstein on a red carpet. The Years before years before, years after the, the claim, whatever. The, it's usually before. The uh, friendly email from the producer to her boss after the alleged rape, none of that is persuasive to me because that is a facet of so many rape claims that are credible and have been borne out. It's also a form of denial. It didn't happen. For sure. I mean, in, in many of these cases... Look, one of the things that was significant about what The New Yorker put out is that it advanced the story into the realm of very serious, violent rape allegations, which hadn't been out there before. That said, even with those very stark, violent fact patterns, 
you're dealing with people who want desperately in some cases to deny to themselves that it happened or that it was that bad, for whom it's a process sometimes of years uh, right. to come grip, to grips with it. Let's, let's talk about Me Too. Um, and I mean, here we are talking about the success you've had in, in exposing Moonves, Weinstein, we could talk about Eric Schneiderman, the New York Attorney General, also uh, part of your success as a reporter. Do you feel that, that Me Too and the changes that have taken place, and I think about the story that was broken by a student newspaper reporter here about a professor who abused women over many, many years. Do you feel that something fundamentally has changed or is the, are these stray stories? I do think something has changed. I think we have a long way to go. Uh, I don't think we've achieved accountability I don't think we've, uh, in the media, fully come to grips with the extent to which we were failing to hold the powerful accountable um, and contributing to a cover-up culture. I don't think we've extended the, t the tentative steps towards accountability to all of the segments of society that desperately need it. You know, it is still very much a set of stories that's been dominated by uh, affluent people, white people, people with a public profile, uh, all of that needs to change. And I'm not just talking about sexual abuse, I'm talking about uh, abuses of power in general that are being covered up every day, everywhere. All I can say though is, I don't see us going back fully either. And I think the example that you set for, for me, looking at the strength of your reporting, but also the strength of your convictions when I came to you in that tentative place, uh, made me convinced that there was no going back. I hope that people reading the stories that I broke, the stories in the Times, the stories of so many reporters that have been banging their heads against the wall trying to expose injustices, uh, have a similar effect, and that we're now galvanized enough as a, a profession not to go back. That's my hope, I don't know. We're gonna find out what the audience thinks in a second. Uh, I'm gonna to turn to you for questions, so think about them. Um, one of the things that, that some critics have raised is that they, they look at cases like, like Stephen uh, Henderson here, former Detroit News, uh, or Tom Brokaw, people who, who were accused and publicly humiliated for flirting or, you know, certainly not raping anyone, certainly not physically abusing anyone. And they feel that we too often are lumping together the Harvey Weinsteins and Les Moonves and Charlie Roses with the Tom Brokers and the Steve Hennessons. Do you think that's true? I, I don't know what the we is in that sentence. I mean, I, I'm very careful to draw those distinctions. Uh, the stories that I've done in this particular beat have been dominated by very serious forms of Absolutely. criminal activity. Yeah. There is certainly a separate and important conversation happening about subtler uh, mores and gender dynamics and how you prevent you know, less obvious forms of harassment. And I think that's important. I don't think the two should be conflated. Uh, and I certainly think that we should view very differently, uh, you know, someone who is a serial rapist and someone who uh, is, you know, untoward in the workplace. Audience, let's get some questions. And just, have you got a microphone? It's hard for us to see here, but just raise your hand. There's microphones right in the audience, so you step up there. Is there one on this side, too? Here. So they're on either side. Just come up. Yes, please identify yourself. Hello, my name is Peter Carroll. I'm in the political science department here. Thanks for your time today. Um, so it's clearly we're in a watershed moment here where there's been a lot of change. It's been really productive. I worry, though, that there's nothing that necessarily prevents the replication of these power structures that led to some of these horrific um, occurrences. And I wonder if there is, in your view, any reason to be optimistic, uh, 
um, or where do you think we go from here? Thank you. What do you think, Ken? <laughs> uh, I'm fairly optimistic, um, I, though I'd be more optimistic if I saw more exposure of Wall Street and some of the mm -hmm. in the business world. I, I, we haven't seen enough of that, and you know it exists. Um, and but I mean, you, it, it's hard to look at what's happening to happened to O'Reilly and Ailes and Weinstein and Moonbez and Schneiderman and 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 Nasser and and the professor here and say that God, something is happening. Um, and you, j you just talk to men, when men talk uh, and they say, I don't want to meet alone with a woman um, because I'm afraid, or I don't want to fly in a plane alone with a woman. And that's a little crazy. On the other hand, that consciousness raising that man, it's going to spread across society and they're going to think twice, I'm hoping, before they abuse another woman. You have to create incentives in the corporate world for change. And those incentives have to remain. Uh, there's a number of ways to do that. Clearly, public disclosure of terrible things that consumers care about is one of them. The CBS story is heartening in a way because they did replace a majority of their board. Uh, they did institute a number of reforms. They, you know, multiple high-level figures who were involved in that cover-up culture I mentioned are now gone from that company. Um, there's, in, in at least one case, a woman in a leadership position um, where previously there was a guy who was involved in this kind of activity. So, you know, I think it's baby steps in the right direction in some of these cases. Now, can you extend that accountability beyond the companies that have been hit so hard? I mean, I've now reported on multiple media organizations and you know there's at least one other case where I've seen the completely the opposite thing happen not one person has lost a job there's absolutely no accountability and there was very much a, a cover-up pattern so I think it can cut either way but I will say that I've been heartened to witness a number of companies uh, not quite preemptively but before the scandal reached the the real fulcrum of like 8,000 words in the New Yorker, <laughs> take the right steps. Uh, you know, I don't want to hold it up as a perfect example, but I think some of the things Uber has done uh, have been interesting. Uh, you know, they brought in a truly independent set of reviewers. That, and that's one really, if you want to get granular about that, that's one thing that companies absolutely must do. The moment you see one of these companies insist on an internal investigation, it is just highlight that in whatever article you're reading. Also, you know, you, you, you read today of the Warner Brothers, the chairman and the CEO being forced to step down because of sexual abuse. And what is, what is Stanky, the head of that division, who, who Warner Brothers reports to, he's saying, I, I think we need a woman. Run and, and that's another change and a very helpful one. It is. And that was very much an open secret that people knew about right. for a long time. Um, so I was heartened to see Kim Masters broke that story in The Hollywood Reporter with a colleague of hers, and it was good reporting. Um, but yes, I think we're seeing more companies than we ever have before actually take the reform seriously, do the independent outside review, uh, change their policies on non-disclosure agreements so that they're not shutting up victims of assault in the company. Uh, and all we can hope for is that all of you guys keep holding their feet to the fire. You know, I think what happens in the national conversation in the public is really important. Understanding those distinctions, making sure we all publicly shame the people who refuse to have the independent review, that'll matter. We have a question here, and then we'll go back over to this side. I thought she was first. Lady first. Uh, oh, sure. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, hi, gentlemen. My name is Cameron. Um, I'm a U of M graduate. And before I ask a question, I'd just quickly like to say I've spent the last 10 years trying to make my way as a performer and comedian in the entertainment industry. And I lived in LA briefly. Back in 2012, when I first moved out there, 
I was no one, no agent, no anything, and my friend with whom I was staying was working as a stylist, and within the first week, he warned me, don't ever go to an audition in a hotel room, and don't ever be alone in a room with Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> I'm not joking, so thank you both so much for the work you've done, and that was, we both had very few contacts or anything, and he still knew to tell me not to be alone with Harvey Weinstein. Everybody knew, so thank you. Um, and my question for you is this, have you noticed a change in the conversation uh, regarding reporting on stories dealing with sexual harassment and sexual assault among your colleagues, um, among other journalists? Has, has the tone behind the scenes changed at all? Has the way people are approaching these stories changed? I'm interested to hear Ken's thoughts on this, because he can also talk about a, a, an earlier period, not to make you feel old. but. but the... <laughs> I am, it's all right. <laughs> but, you know, when you were trying to crack this in 2001, 2002, I'm, I'm sure it was a very different environment, um, and I'm sure that contributed in part to the outcome of, of those attempts. But from my standpoint, in this more recent swath of history, the answer is actually no, not so much. I, I don't think any of the reporters I encountered were the problem. I don't think I, I saw a lot of skepticism about the news value of these stories. Uh, you know, every reporter who saw the amount of evidence I had immediately had the same reaction I had, that Ken had, that the New Yorker had, that this was a big important story that we all needed to fight for. Um, you know, it was other categories of people around those stories that were trying to quash it, not, not the journalists. Uh, I will say that there's now a, a set of tools that have been somewhat refined by that great work that's come out of the Times and other publications, and I'd like to think in part what The New Yorker has done as well, where maybe reporters who understand in the way I just described the importance uh, but are grappling with how to go about it have a little more of a playbook to go by. I mean, I, I get asked all the time by student journalists and um, by reporters in general, sort of, how do you crack this sort of a thing where there's a vast conspiracy and a cover-up and all of these forces working to stop it? And um, I, I hope that there's some lessons learned that make it a, a more uh, kind of well-greased process. I, I would um, uh, come at it a little differently uh, going, because I'm going back further on this. When I go back to 2002, and, and I'm reporting on the brutality of Harvey's personality, how he verbally abused people, how he literally took a reporter, put him in a headlock and started punching him, uh, how he, Julie Tamar, he screamed and threatened her life partner, um, Stacy Snyder, who was then working for Steven Spielberg, he literally physically threatened her, and she's a tiny person. And I'm saying, as I'm, as I'm reporting this, and, and I was able to get these people to go on the record with what, what he had done, but I'm saying, why aren't people reporting about Harvey's brutality then? And it was known, it was very common, he was constantly apologizing. With me, he would say, I know I've changed, right? And, and the four or five months I spent reporting this story, he probably three or four different times said to me, I've changed, I've learned my lesson. Okay, he hadn't. And if you think about it, I knew, but I couldn't prove, that if you're going to bully people that way and yell at them and stuff, you're going to bully them in other ways as well, sexually. And I, it was not on the radar of the press, and it should have been. And, and so I th and things have changed, but back then, mm -hmm. it, it, he got away with stuff and, and he had enablers who worked for him, uh, who I, helped him. It's worth noting, though, that one of the things that has changed to this question about journalists, you've been lucky at The New Yorker, but one of the elements of this story has been journalists having to report this out in their own newsrooms. NPR, the head of news, forced to step down for sexual harassment. NBC, certainly. Uh, Matt part of the reason that, that they may have been covering Sorry. this up was that they had their own problems with Matt Lauer that they were not addressing. And so newsrooms, I think, have had to um, come to terms with how to report this out. 
and deal with it within their own ranks and within their own power structures. And that seems to, I think, be something that's changed. But we think of it today as a felony, or the equivalent of a felony. And back in 2002, three, four, five, I don't think we did. I don't think too ma enough journalists thought of it as a felony. That, that's a fantastic point you just made. And again, the CBS example is instructive there without commenting on other <laughs> news organizations that she mentioned. At CBS, you had a, a clear example of a pattern of cover-ups that in turn made the, the company's ability to report on the issue compromised. The two things are deeply connected, and you're absolutely right that one of the things that's changed is that the news business has had its own reckoning, although I would say not enough yet and not everywhere. And I would add one more fine distinction, because this is it's an important question that you asked. When I say every journalist I encountered was had sort of come around by that period in 2017 and really understood the importance of, of this kind of evidence when you have it, it is important to be a little granular about the term journalist, right? Because one of the things I also reported on, for instance, was Harvey Weinstein was using the tabloid world to smear accusers. He was using the National Enquirer to secretly and at times illegally record uh, accounts from people that he thought would be damaging to his accusers. That in turn led to a series of stories I broke about Donald Trump using the Enquirer in a very similar way. Um, so there's the, the tabloid segment, which employs a lot of great people who have the same investigative instincts we do, but also has been subverted and turned into a tool for powerful people trying to suppress things. And too often, I think that has happened in the mainstream media, too. Let's go to the question over here, please. Yes, I'm Tom Higgins. I'm a local resident. And I came out to hear this great conversation tonight, so thank you. Um, Ken, you said something about the report, reporter being put in a headlock. And I, I want to ask both of you about that. I mean, what happens to you? when you investigate or when you report on these big guys, are you, are you think about your safety? Are you, do they confront you in person? Or what happens after that? Well, you know, with, with Harvey, uh, when I confronted Harvey about the rape and the, the two women he paid, the 250 each, this was in 02, it was our final interview. And I had spent a lot of time with him prior to that, flying the wall, interviewing him. and other people who work for him. And I said to him, Harvey, did you rape, and I named the woman's name, and did you also abuse, and I named the woman's name. And he stood up, just two of us were in a conference room, they had a, his former wife, Eve, had a, had a place where she worked, on Broadway in the upper 60s. And it was just the two of us. It was probably five or six o'clock at night. And he stood up over me and clenching his fists. I'm seated at this small conference table. He is standing over me with his fists like this and his lip is quivering. And he's screaming at me. And at that point, I said, I'm not gonna sit down and let this guy take a punch at me. I'm gonna stand up. And actually, I was kind of hoping he would take a punch of me at that, because I just wanted to beat the, <laughs> beat the son of a bitch. And, and, and we're the same height. He's about 100 pounds heavier than me, but I'm faster than he is. I knew that. <laughs> and as soon as I stood up, he started to cry. And he said these were consensual affairs. That's what he said. I'm a lousy husband, but I did not rape name the woman and I uh, did not abuse and name the other one and it was an amazing instance and actually what do you take away from that one of the things you take away from it the guy was a coward he was a bully and and he folded I never felt danger this guy we want to hear his answer because he actually was chased and 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 wrote about it well, I, <laughs> I wrote about uh, certainly the fact that Harvey Weinstein hired uh, 
a private Israeli intelligence firm founded by uh, and with board members from the Mossad um, and former members of the Mossad uh, and kind of marketing a, you know, like a combat ready skill set, um, you know, from, <laughs> from elite intelligence uh, circles. Uh, and and I did I did write about you know some of the work that they did tracking uh, accusers. Uh, I did write about the fact that they were compiling dossiers on uh, reporters, uh, and that beyond just the work of this one firm, uh, Black Cube, there was a longer pattern with Harvey Weinstein of employing uh, PIs to do work that that at the very least bordered on intimidation, um, certainly to try to smear reporters who were trying to, to crack this stuff. Um, and he was successful in, in using that as a bulwark against the story breaking for quite some time. You know, I, I talked in those stories about uh, David Carr, uh, the great media reporter who um, had circled this story, I think, in a, in a way that was not dissimilar to, to you. You know, he was passionate about it, he died wanting very much to, to break it. He had heard some of these accounts of harassment and assault and was never able to crack it, but um, he certainly caused enough trouble that his name was in all of those files that I got and um, you know, he had been tracked, he was convinced he was being followed and um, certainly Harvey told his private investigators that he had been successful in intimidating him. Uh, I have not written about the full extent of the work that was done on reporters in the more recent kind of present day time frame. So we can look forward to that? But that, that is a story that will be worth telling at some point, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. Because it is, you know, not to be glib about it, it, this is part of the problem that we're talking about here tonight. If you are wealthy enough and powerful enough and maybe are convinced you're living in a spy movie or something, you can actually purchase these kinds of exotic services to intimidate people and send them on the run and make them scared. And that is a tactic that I think we should really scrutinize and maybe look at curtailing. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example of how unscrutinized it is. One of the stories I broke was it was all fancy, powerful, uh, totally acceptable and celebrated and polite company lawyers who signed the contracts with these firms. And there were several firms, but Black Cube, which I just described to you, for instance, was hired through David Boyce, who we've both dealt with over the years and is a you know very kind of genteel, uh, high society guy, a, a liberal hero, um, has argued all of these high profile cases. Um, you know, and I was able to obtain the contracts that he had signed saying, kill these stories, secret agents from Israel. <laughs> we have a question here, and then we're going to take a question from Twitter. Hi, my name's Hannah. I'm a junior here at U of M. Um, I'm currently taking a class with Will Potter, who's a Wallace, um, Knight Wallace fellow also. Um, so I'm at, the class is actually called How to Live in a World on Fire. And as you might guess, it's how to live in this world with a lot of misinformation and people constantly in conflict and a lot of different institutions keeping people in power. Um, and we're reading a lot about how ordinary people actually can break stories like this and how writers, ordinary people, and communicators in general can actually go against these people in power and break these cycles that are happening over and over again. Um, so you did mention that you had hit this low point um, where it seemed like you had everything to lose, and we, d we have been talking a lot about a lot of people throughout history have been in the same situation. So I'm wondering exactly what that felt like and what kind of motivation you had c to go forward with that, because as we all know, like being in that position is very difficult and it's very easy to give up. So if everything's working against you and you have everything to lose and it seems like you have nothing to gain, what exactly keeps you going? And what advice do you have to people who might be in that similar situation in the future? Well, first of all, I think it's important to point out that what the sources in those stories were living through was exponentially more difficult than anything I dealt with as a reporter. You know, I wasn't reliving intense personal trauma. Uh, 
I didn't have to grapple with the extra dimension of not only might my career fall apart, but also I'm, I'm going to be staring down this very specific kind of stigma that sexual violence carries. Um, you know, they were doing something incredibly brave that is difficult on a level that honestly, as someone who isn't a survivor, probably can never fully understand. That's not unrelated to the answer to the question. I looked at those examples and I realized that I had, you know, looked these women in the eye and said, I I'm going to do right by this story. You know, I, I promise you, I'm going to make sure I ferret out the truth on this. And I realized I wouldn't be able to sleep at night if I had dropped it. Um, and I, I wish I could tell you that that felt like a, like a simple um, ironclad mandate that kind of settled over me. Uh, the truth is I, I was scared and I was completely uncertain as to whether I was doing the right thing. And there was no way to know for sure that things would unspool the way that they did and that society would be as receptive to these stories as ultimately we all were. And again, I was coming off of a period in which I had been told by, you know, my bosses, my agents, you know, this, this is causing too many speed bumps, you've got to stop, this is, who cares, is it really that big a deal, is it really worth it? And, and honestly, even some people I trusted, uh, you know, loved ones who said, God, you're going to give up your ability to tell all these other stories just for this one story, which maybe won't even make a dent. And the only lesson I can maybe impart from that is, I am sure you either have or will encounter the same moment where you all have no idea whether you're doing the right thing. And the best thing I had to hang on to was a, you know, a little voice that was telling me, like, hey, it's pretty clear what the right thing here is. And you're going to let down yourself and all these people who have put so much on the line if you don't do it. And so I would just encourage you to listen to that voice. You heard two things here. <clears throat> I think you heard an explanation of why women felt comfortable in talking. And the word is empathy. This guy exudes it. And he gave them confidence that, that he was on their side. The second thing, though, I think, in answer to that question, is that you're a journalist, and you've got to be able to prove things. You can't assert things. And you know, you might believe that someone is a monster or doing monstrous things, but as a journalist, you've got to be able to prove it. And when I said before, I, I wondered, Ronan, whether you were a zealot or not, and I came to feel you were judicious. And that's what a good journalist is supposed to be. And, and so anyone, if you want to go out and, and nail that bastard who's doing these terrible things, prove it. you got to prove it. It was a particularly stark dilemma in my case because I had something we so rarely have as reporters, which was this tremendous body of evidence, uh, and particularly the subject of the story admitting on tape to it. Right. And so that, it, it made it incredibly difficult for me to rationalize to myself stopping just because it would be convenient for my career. One of our um, Knight Wallace fellows, Netta Ulabi of NPR, has been following Twitter during the conversation. Do we have a question? We have hundreds of questions. <laughs> we have many, many, many questions. Uh, this one is for you, uh, Ronan Farrow. And by the way, we're so glad you're here. Thanks for being here. You. Um, do you see a connection between your work for the State Department and the sexual abuse campaign? I, I love that question. Uh, I, during all of these stories that we've just been describing, I was struggling to finish a book that also had been canceled by my previous original publisher for it in, in that same summer where everything went down. Um, and they refused to look at a single page of, of it. And I had worked on it for five years and like embedded with warlords and terrified my mom. And um, <laughs> uh, so I decided I wasn't going to give up on that either. And, and actually, this, the, probably the thematic link there is, um, while the stakes are slightly different, 
that was a, a book, War on Peace, which is full of whistleblowers who were afraid for their jobs, but in a lot of cases went fully on the record anyway, you know, current Foreign Service officers to say, hey, something bad is happening here. Uh, there are these mass purges of all of our experts and all of our negotiators, all of our diplomats. Um, our embassies are empty. Uh, crazy stuff is going down because we literally don't have anyone attending to our most important alliances around the world. Uh, and I, I would hope that if you read that book, that's the link you come away with. You know, it's brave people making the story possible. Really good book, by the way. We have a Thank question here. Hi, my name is Emily Lawson, and I, I've been teaching here for 19 years in women's studies and American culture. A rigorous study uh, survey of students in 2015 conducted by the American Association of Universities and endorsed by the U of M administration found that over 3,000 University of Michigan students are sexually assaulted every year and over 70% of undergraduate women students have been sexually harassed ever since entering here. The U of M Office for Institutional Equity, which handles Title IX cases, has been heavily criticized for ignoring complaints and conducting biased investigations that protect the university. The official university report for last year stated that despite complaints going way up after Me Too, Title IX investigations resulted in zero, zero confirmed findings of student sexual assault for the entire year. The entire year, zero. So my questions are, would you like to receive more information about this subject? <laughs> or, a bat signal going out. Uh, or would you consider investigating this matter further or sending word out to your colleagues to report on why survivors of sexual assault and harassment rarely receive justice through the university's complaint process? Thank you for that. So I, I've done a lot of reporting on sexual assault on campus. It's an incredibly complicated and important subset of the issues we're talking about. Um, it's definitely part of the, you know, the set of roots that underpinned my pitching that sexual assault in Hollywood story. It was having done all this reporting on, on campus issues. Uh, look, it's a setting where people are in their formative years. Uh, you've got kids navigating these same challenges that I've talked about that are almost impossible to surmount for anyone of any age. Um, people are at their most vulnerable. They're, it intersects with alcohol culture. People are drinking for the first time. Uh, obviously, as a society, we have a long way to go to get a healthy drinking culture uh, uh, in place for people who are in those formative years. Um, it intersects with a whole separate set of issues and attendant reporting on frat culture in many schools. Um, there are a lot of spaces that need serious reforms uh, to create a safe space for, for people who should never have to be survivors of sexual violence again, but too often are. In terms of the specific intricacies of the Title IX offices uh, on this campus and others, those systems are broken. Uh, I have not reported on University of Michigan specifically, but across the company they are broken. And the striking thing is that both Accusers and accused often walk away from Title IX processes on campus feeling that the process was unjust, uh, that there wasn't a fair hearing of facts. Uh, it's a, there's a trickle down from government policy to the nature of those tribunals that get set up on campuses. Uh, the Obama administration, I think in a well-intentioned effort to create more accountability, uh, tied Title IX funding to the creation of kind of parallel justice processes on campus. A lot of people don't know this. I was fascinated to find this out when I was reporting on it. Um, and what they, they mandated was that it, it be a kind of a, a mini court system that a school has to set up that has a lower burden of proof than the actual criminal justice system. And it makes sense in theory, right? You want to decrease the barrier for people, very often women, 
coming forward with these claims. But in practice, what ends up happening is schools that have no expertise in this subject set up these kangaroo courts. Sometimes they're staffed by like wealthy alumni. Some, some schools do a better job and they try to bring in experts, but there's no real guidelines. It's a free for all. And, and in a lot of cases with survivors that I've talked to who have dealt with this in a, in a college context, they, they feel like they were actually actively discouraged from going to the police because the school wanted them to do it in this parallel process. So I've just outlined to you a whole slew of messy problems and absolutely no solutions. Um, you're welcome. <laughs> Did you say 3,000? Not a small number. Right, and based on the numbers you're saying, I would assume that this is an issue that needs serious work here, as it does in, on so many campuses. And uh, look, I, I will say that in a lot of the cases that, that I've looked at, um, at Harvard and other schools, student journalism played a really, really active role in triggering reform. Um, we've just talked to some wonderful student journalists here on this campus, and I, I would hope that this is something that they're looking at. Uh, and, and yes, also, uh, if you have specific information about something you think is a story, I would say this writ large for any of you on kind of any subject that fits into these themes of the abuse of power or corruption or things that need fixing, send it to, to a reporter. There are a lot of good ones. I would like to think I'm one of them. Um, I may not be able to tackle this subject or any particular subject, but I'll at least do my damnedest to take a look and maybe route it to a reporter who I know is working on this stuff. What, one of the lessons, and then I'll shut up, I've been talking at length, of Ken Oletta and his generosity is I was a journalist in need. Not just, it's not even about the factual specifics. I, I needed to hear from someone I respected, keep going. You know, this is worth the fight. And he was, played such a pivotal, influential role as I was struggling with this thing. And then I found also along the way, you know, a community of other reporters who had similarly tried and were generous and helped, people like Ben Wallace who had tried at the, the New York Magazine when the story was killed there. Um, and I really came away from those experiences so committed to trying to pay that forward. And I, I don't know that I'll ever be able to do what Ken Oletta did in terms of basically rescuing a, a story that, that needed rescuing. but. Boy, I'll try it every chance I get. So if, if you, any of you send me a lead and I can't tackle it, I will move mountains to try to get it to someone good. Just think about the person on the other end of the phone, one of these horrible men. Uh, sir, Ronan Farrow's on the phone for you. <laughs> I, I think you've probably earned that reaction too. People don't like our calls. Um, just but to, thank you sincerely, Ken, for everything that you do. Just to point back to the beginning of the conversation, Ronan used the phrase, these systems are broken. If you didn't catch it in the beginning, Nisa Khan's story on just this issue um, was called Broken Record. And so it is being looked at here. And certainly send your tips to Ronan, but send them here too. And we have a question here. Um, hi, my name is Evelyn Wallace. Um, I'm a junior interested in law school. I just want to say, I think it was a South Park joke, too, where they said you're getting a call from Ronan Farrow. Uh, <laughs> so you've made it. Um, but I just wanted to ask... I grew up on South Park. That was, I was, uh, you know, that got me a little verklempt. It got me excited, too. I, my brothers knew who you were. It was a big deal. Um, but I just wanted to ask, um, Ronan specifically, given your experience in the State Department and uh, going to law school, especially at such a young age, thank you, um, you're obviously coming at this from a journalistic standpoint, and that's been where you've been able to make the biggest impact, but I'm curious to know what you think the future of the Me Too movement and sexual violence and sexual assault is going to look like at the government level and at the legal level where, you know, as you were saying, Ken, it wasn't being called a felony until about five years ago. Um, so even though we have these legal structures in place and in theory, if someone speaks up, they should be able to be protected by whatever um, official source they go through. But obviously these are, ha are things happening in Senate offices, in 
professional business offices. So I just wanted to know if you see it going forward primarily or even only as a news article that change is made or whether you think there's going to be legal recourse and like governmental change to stop it as a, you know, as a nation. There has to be policy reform and legislative reform. And one of the things I've been most excited by and inspired by is we've seen some tentative steps towards that. At states around the country uh, and at a federal level, there's been some legislation uh, introduced as well. Certainly different states are overhauling uh, the ways in which non-disclosure agreements are handled. Uh, there have been some efforts to curtail the use of the kinds of agreements Harvey Weinstein used in cases involving sexual assault and harassment. Uh, corporate policy is also really important here. You know, I mentioned the companies that have sort of ended their reliance on, on NDAs in that context. Um, all of that is important. If, if it doesn't get baked into our systems in our culture, uh, then the reform might well slip away. So I think all of us as voters and members of the American public have to keep the fire under people too, you know, that this is incumbent on our legislators and they really can make substantial changes that will matter. Let's take another question here on this side. Hi, um, I'm Lauren Bartholomew. I'm a freshman here at Michigan and I'm um, sorry, I had to write my question down just to make sure it didn't sound weird. Um, so how do you think your role or position as a man affected your ability to break this story? And do you think if you were a woman, would it have been taken as seriously or been as successful? Uh, so structural sexism is a thing, if you didn't notice. Um, <laughs> I've really had to actually push hard, you know, for instance, when I talk about these stories publicly as I break them, uh, to redirect attention towards the, the women whose voices were at the heart of this thing. And I think that gets at the point you're asking about, you know, pe the, not just individuals, but the kind of high level forces that guide the national conversation do gravitate towards privileged people, white people, male people. And I think the more we can all do to push to have voices heard that aren't heard enough, we've got to. And I try in every conversation I have, um, you know, for instance, to really talk extensively about the work of women reporters who are really pivotal to this thing becoming public, to talk about those sources. Um, in terms of the actual reporting process, you know, it was it was a barrier, it was an obstacle. Um, you're asking women in a lot of cases to talk very graphically about these incredibly personal experiences. Uh, and that just takes a lot of time and building trust and assuring them of exactly what you hope to accomplish and your commitment to ferreting out the truth. Um, it takes I think as a guy especially, really letting sources control their destiny. So this is an interesting point. You know, not all of the reporters who worked on this story and other stories on this beat um, necessarily adhere to an ironclad rule where if someone doesn't want to be named, you don't name them. And I, I don't think that's evil or wrong. You know, it's a case-by-case -case decision and, and I've seen reporters that I really like and respect um, for instance, you know, name uh, uh, an accuser of someone uh, who's begging not to be named because they have that name in, in documents. And it, that, there were times in, in these stories we've talked about where I would get calls from uh, upset sources saying, you know, this other reporter is going to name me and I'm crying and I'm telling them not to. And I think to the extent that gender intersected with my reporting process, it probably, it reduced the space I might have had to to do that, you know, whether that's right or wrong, and it's very hard to judge from the outside, you know, I don't know what those reporters were weighing in terms of pros and cons of those decisions. Um, but for me personally, when I was faced with the same decision, sometimes about those same sources, um, I always went with not naming them, 
even when it meant losing a scoop, and sometimes I did lose the scoop as a result. Because I just, you know, I was treading in territory that was not totally my own, and, and part of that was the gender dynamics there. Um, I really felt like I had to work to honor what these women were doing and to acknowledge that I couldn't fully understand what it's like to be a woman in that situation and to let them call the shots. Let's take another question from Twitter. This one's directed to you both. How can journalists cover abuses of power in an era when the resources for news gathering are decreasing? By the way, where is the disembodied Twitter voice yeah, coming from? I'm oh, it's you. Hello. <laughs> oh, hi. I just wanted to say hi. Thank you. Ken, I'll I, let you wait, tackle I wanna, this one. I want to hear the question again. I was spending so much time looking for you. <laughs> <laughs> now you can see me, the voice of Twitter, the mouthpiece. How can journalists cover abuses of power in an era when the resources for news gathering are decreasing? It's harder. I mean, one of the problems uh, is... I mean, you look at what's happened to local news coverage across this country. I mean, you're talking about newsrooms that are depleted, newspapers that have gone out of business. And you look at, at I mean, the Chicago Tribune, for instance, has, has, doesn't have reporters in the state capitol. Um, and, you know, this is across the country, this is true. Where you, so the check that we're supposed to provide or people calling us and saying, would you be interested in doing this story at, on the University of Michigan or Columbia University or wherever, you don't have that body of reporters to, to pursue that. Or they're so busy because the newsrooms are so depleted, they don't have time. And what, 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 what in between the cracks of what Ronan is saying, I don't mean cracks in terms of wisecracks, Fundamental to what he did and his success is he had the luxury of time. We were talking about it at the Wallace House today with, with the fellows. He had, this is not a story, dear editor, that I could break for you tomorrow that you just put me on today. You're going to have to devote, let me devote weeks, months maybe, to get to, to report on Les Moonves or Harvey Weinstein or whoever. And it's very hard to do in a, in a depleted indus news industry. Um, so I, I worry about that, and particularly local coverage, which is slimmed down. We've got two questions here that we'll take quickly. Yes, I have a comment, actually, uh, and I think it's something that needs to be said. I have to say that I strongly disagree with the presentations tonight. Ronan Farrow began his public career as an accomplice of Richard Holbrook and Hillary Clinton two figures who are responsible for more blood than this entire lecture hall could hold in Washington's naked pursuit of its geopolitical interests in the Middle East and Central Asia, known as the War on Terror, the Democratic Party version in particular. Farrow went on to help launch the Me Too sexual witch hunt, which has further undermined the presumption of innocence and due process, and has nothing to do with the conditions of women, working class women in particular. The destruction of lives and careers is a McCarthyite campaign which has created an atmosphere of simulation of terror and ultimately wider members of the population are eagerly devoted to participation in that I, I feel neglected. What, what is my crime? Yeah, where's, where's Ken? Don't I have a crime? <laughs> uh, I'll take that point by point. Don't, but he's walking don't, out, so he don't. All right, he doesn't want the answer. Thank you. Um, Next question. All right. I'm happy to respond to all of that. I, I get, you don't I have get to. a lot, you know, the t you should see my Twitter mentions. That's tame. <laughs> are, are, do we have someone jumping line? Am I allowed to? I think we have a question here. Okay. Uh, well, I'd say my question has a slightly different tone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, well, my name is uh, Ben Miller. I'm a freshman here at U of M. Um, and I was wondering if you could comment on the politicization of the Me Too movement, especially after the Brett Kavanaugh hearings last year, um, and how we as a country can overcome some of the divisiveness that has um, 
been especially relevant and pertinent in our political sphere. Could you define what you mean by politicization of the YouTube movement? Um, well, I think especially during the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, um, we saw with um, Christine Blasey Ford, um, especially around the country, um, the fact that you know it was a very divisive issue, and a lot of people had very strong opinions on it. And people talk about you know the Kavanaugh effect in the 2018 midterms. Um, so I was wondering if you could comment on that. So you mean the politicization is not by the Me Too movement, it's by the critics of the Me Too movement? Yes, it, it's a, a point that I think about a lot. Uh, so I'm in the, this remarkable position where um, sort of interspersed with the uh, all caps death threats are both tweets from people saying uh, you're a, a Trump lackey, you know, all you do is take down Democrats after the Eric Schneiderman, th Eric Schneiderman was a prominent Democrat who was investigating Trump, uh, you know, Harvey Weinstein and Les Moonves were prominent Democratic bundlers and donors. Um, uh, Harvey Weinstein was a very close ally of Hillary Clinton's. So, you know, I, I get this suspicion that I'm somehow an agent of the right wing, routinely. And then uh, I also get, you know, the moment I turn to a, a subject that isn't unflattering about a conservative, the barrage of, uh, you know, choice tweets from that crowd saying, you know, you're a liberal hack and a cuck and uh, insult, or what, what, was the, what are the terms that, you know, that you get like the little, the, the frog meme, and the, <laughs> I get all the racists with the X by their names, and the, so, and some of it is very clearly um, part of the kind of machinery of Twitter harassment that happens today. It's not real people, it's like Twitter eggs with no followers, um, uh, and like, you know, a MAGA thing in their, in their profile. Um, but some of it does reflect a genuine uh, condition that we all live in now, which is everything gets thrust into this cauldron of partisan mistrust. And what's saddening about that is it's, it's fundamentally antithetical to what we do as investigative reporters. So, you know, I'll, I'll do a, if the evidence is there, I'll, I'll do a body of reporting about anyone of any persuasion. Um, I don't care. I'm, to the extent that I'm, I'm in it, I'm in it because I'm ambitious about getting the big story. Um, and there just, there is such a shrinking space for that kind of uh, approach and for any kind of understanding that someone might genuinely have that approach. Um, you know, there's this assumption that you just, you must be on our side or on the other side and this sort of crushing disappointment when you, when you, it proves out that you're not on any of the sides. A and the, the more specific way that that plays out is, you mentioned the Kavanaugh reporting. I mean, we, at the New Yorker, Jane Mayer and I, um, broke the first details of the Blasey Ford allegation and it was, the Washington Post subsequently did great reporting where she went on the record. Um, and it was uh, an important story, you know? It was a claim that uh, Congress was uh, holding on to and that hadn't been looked at fully, but that was kind of gaining momentum as a source of rancor within the relevant committees. Um, so it was, regardless of its truth, a hugely important story at that moment in history. Um, and then also, you know, once we began digging into it, there was a significant body of evidence that needed to be presented to the public so that they could decide what they thought about this. Um, you know, and we subsequently did reporting around Deborah Ramirez's allegation, um, which had a remarkable amount of corroboration behind it, including someone who had seen her crying right after all those years ago um, and who hadn't talked to her since, had had no contact. Um, you know, and this is a story that had lived for years and years and years in the Yale community. And then, you know, there were others too. And the thing that happens when you have that kind of environment of partisan sniping, and it turns into the kind of circus that it turned into there, and the Twitter bot farms get spun up, uh, you wind up with sources shutting down. And that was a bigger story that the public didn't see in full because of the atmosphere of partisanship that you're talking about. And I would argue that that is 
as unfair to the accusers that you heard from and that you didn't as it is to Brett Kavanaugh, who deserved a full airing of the facts and who now has you know, this sort of amorphous pall over his tenure on the court um, that's completely unresolved and that has manifested not in uh, fact-based inquiry going forward, but in just this kind of Twitter troll war. Can That's I a stat state of affairs. Fact-based fact. You've got a plan to catch. <laughs> um, well, anyway, I hate the partisanship, and I hope that fact-based reporting is an antidote to it. So. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed the conversation. Again, I thank all of you for coming out. It's nice to see so many people here engaged in a real conversation. Um, and even when we had an attempt to pull it away from conversation, I appreciate the civility of the audience and of our guests. One of the things that we prize here is, is, is hearing all sides and engaging people in real conversation. Um, because we spend so much of our time now with our heads and devices and yelling um, at our TVs and at our phones and yelling in people in all caps on Twitter that this is a good space to be in. And when we spend so much time hearing opinions, I want to just underscore that we have two reporters on stage. And what we've been talking about, the in the weeds part, uh, is reporting not prosecutorial, opinion-driven uh, attacks, but reporting and looking for facts and being open to where the facts take you, and that is journalism. Um, you'll see when you go out, there's a Wallace House table. We have some pins. I'm wearing one. Several people are wearing them. Uh, and they're very simple statements of what we believe, journalism's place in society. One, the one I'm wearing, is something uttered by our own university president who at one of our events stood up uh, and said a very simple sentence, journalists, champions of the people. Uh, and we like that sentence much better than the other sentence that is offer, often uttered about journalists now that we are enemies of the people. Um, so journalists, champions of the people. And the other pin says, uphold democracy, support journalists. Uh, and we have to remember that this is a pillar of our democracy. Somebody asked a question about policy change, legislative change. Without journalists doing their work, uh, we can't get to some of the change that we need at the small levels, at the state levels, at the national levels. Uh, and so Ken and Ronan, thank you for your work. Thank you for taking time out of your work to come here. And thank you all for joining in the conversation. And thank you to the fellowship. Thank you.